Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Solo React Talk. Tonight, I'm going to be reacting to Legend of Cronan the King. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, we have finally arrived at Cronan the King. Um, this is part of the Cronan the Canon playlist done by Baltimore Sky to Warhammer. If you want to check out my previous reactions, remember the playlist card is going to be at the top. Just click on it and you'll be able to access them. If you want to check out the original video as well as Baltimore's Guide to Warhammer's YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. Yes, let's start. Three, two, one, go. Between the time when chaos broke Cadia and the return of the Sons of the Emperor, there was an age undreamed of. And unto this, Cronan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Cronan the King. Story continued from Cronan the Cunning Playlist. Cronan, the Cunning One, big boss of not only the Cunning War, but now undisputed master of all Orchidum on Aquilonia, sat on his golden chair, his thong. In his new luminous position, he had taken to riding around in it most of the time. Not that he could not walk or stride, leap or charge. Of course not. To even consider such a thing was tantamount to a crime against the guards themselves. Yeah, I, I was about to say don't be complacent, you know. Don't sit on that thong for too long because uh, people will probably see you you know, becoming lazy and weak, and they might try and take a chance on you. Uh, like a certain someone called Backstabber. <laughs> yeah, so don't be complacent. For was he not the cunning one, the most orky of all orcs on Aquilonia? Was he not even now called a prophet unto himself? For once, there had been no prophet at all. Well, if you ignore the predations of the less scrupulous tooth exchangers of the bad moons. But I feel as if we are getting bogged down, for I was specifically referring to the prophet meaning a warrior of the Great Ones, Gork and Mork, not the grubby money changers of the Aquilonian Stork Exchange. Stork Exchange? <laughs> what are you guys exchanging? What kind of trade are you guys doing out here? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Why they had to try to institute the stork as some form of elevated and more genteel version of the much more solid and dependable chief was, quite frankly, almost unfathomable to all. Even Cronan had been informed of this particular stripe of oddity. And considering it had nothing to do with the usual activities of the real odd boys, it perplexed Cronan to such a degree that he sent out his bodyguard. Cronan's cunt, um, Black Lucian, to identify and then purloin the wretch behind it all. Of course, this meant a hearty round of thrashings was unleashed on near everyone in the war until they indeed found the culprit. And when said undesirable was put to the question in front of Cronan, it was easily discerned that this ne'er-do-well had just attempted to be cunning. He had, in his infinite infamy, even gone so far as admitting to copying the cunning one himself, and had been thinking about it. For this orc had come from a location that had been abundant with the sad, long, doleful white birds, the storks, and he had captured many, but he had not known what to do with them. Then he cogitated on it, and had come up with his own plan. 
to trade multiple amounts of teeth for the birds, explaining it was a new system of finances and that it was actually the idea of Cronan. <laughs> when? When did Cronan think about something like this? I don't remember this. <laughs> this is a lie. Um, interesting. Very interesting. And this orc is dangerous. He's thinking. There can only be one orc that's able, you know, to think. And that is Cronan. If anyone else starts thinking, it will be a serious contender. Um, you need to take care of this. <laughs> you need to take care of this, Cronan. You know? <laughs> yeah. Of course. The moment that Cronan had heard this, he had risen. And he had the look of the ages about him. His huge girth and prodigious stature. The largest any orc had ever been in all of Aquilonian legend, even. Cronan looked unto a deity of destructive power. Striding to his stork cellar, this peddler of lies, he had taken a small hat from a stand near himself as he processed. And when he had approached the wistful and cunning bad moon, all he could see was the face of the traitor who had betrayed him so much before with these kind of antics. Fool remembered how the entire war's economic model and its loot distribution matrices had been utterly thrown out of kilter with the Bad Moon's very successful methods of creating false scarcity, and so Uh, would Cronan think this way? I don't think so. <laughs> There's just too many advanced words in there, but okay. Squiffing all trades in their favor. Or at least, this is what he would tell his knobs if asked later. But the quintessence of it was far simpler. For this upstart scum had claimed to be... thinking. He had to go. And thus it was that Cronan took his spare hat and crowned this orc with it. Alas, he stated, it did not quite sit right. It was floppy. So with a mighty thwack with a thunder hammer he had lying around, he attached it snugly to the orc in question. Now the hat and the head were one. And it was yeah, they're one, but the guy's dead. <laughs> well... Look, it's something that I was also suggesting, so yeah, it had to happen, but wow. <laughs> he gave him my hat and then he smashed his head in. Wow, okay. Okay, Cronan. Never be removed. Alas, in his exuberance to create a properly jaunty look, Cronan had smashed the hat and head into an almost unrecognizable smoosh on the floor. But all agreed, the hat would never come off the orc's head. And thus was their lord right yet again. Even in sartorial excellence, none could match their lord. Thus it was that Cronan put an end to the clearly unfair and corrupt stork exchange. At least that was one tedious issue out of the way. But where were we? Ah, of course, profits. As I was attempting to relate before, there had been no profits at all, and now there would appear to be two. The first, the prophet of Gork. The god of brutal cunning was, of course, the mighty Gazlul Mag Uruk Thraka. His name was on the lips of near all of Orchidom across the entire galaxy. And in his wake, wars were fought the likes had never been seen. Yet now, in Cronan, some muttered that he was a prophet as well. The prophet of Mork. The god of cunning brutality. Now, Cronan knew he did not have the same level of notoriety as his guiding light, Thraka, but in his own mind at least, Cronan had gotten off to a very good start. Yes, a very good start, you know, uh, with Aqualonia. However, there's still a larger galaxy to contend with. So you, you still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. He was decades, if not centuries, behind the legendary Gazgul, Yet he was on his way. And with Mork on his side, there was nothing he could not do. Well, apart from getting his left arm to stop pulling at his butt cheeks, or sticking one of its fingers into his nose whenever he was not thinking about it. And he rarely thought about his arms, if truth be told. But if he was not careful, the force with which the hand was put into either his butt crack or his nose could be, well, a bit ouchy, actually. 
Cronan was also aware that he was a little more runty than his massive biceps and triceps and all of the seps festooned on his normal arm, for it had once belonged to his erstwhile rival, Tooth Smasher. And so it was that Cronan was often seen pumping weights with his one scrawnier arm while being walked around on his golden thong. Now all knew that it was decidedly un to be humble, so to have himself elevated thus was completely in keeping with the expectations of his tribes and mobs, the warriors of his mighty war. Yet it did serve another purpose. Two, actually. The first was that any platform heavy enough to support his thong was quite large, tall and wide. Many platforms had been tested for suitability, but it had come down to not just the weight of the thong itself, but also the massive weight of the cunning one himself. And so it was that the only receptacle worthy of his standing and robust enough to support he and his thong had been quite fun. And thus, his support platform had been designated as the only Bane Blade heavy battle tank they had found on the planet. A shame to use it thus, but nothing his mech boys could do made it run again. Uh... Okay, so what? Do, do you know other orcs carry it <laughs> since it can't move? Yeah, but this is a big tank. It's a big, big tank. How many cannons? One, two, three, four, five. Five cannons. Wow. Not wanting to waste this majestic battle tank that could otherwise have been torn to pieces for muggins and gubbins and probably ended as motorized butt-scratchers, or some other frippery, Cronan had requisitioned it himself. Hence, he was carried around on the backs of thousands of glots. Getting it up was always an issue, as the glots required the use of a kind of forklift truck to get it over their heads, and many, many, many glots had been squished under it when they had not gotten the numbers right. No! Oh my gosh! I thought maybe, like, you know, orcs, the knobs, they would be the one carrying the, the battle tank, but not the crafts, guys. Come on, these things are puny. Oh, gosh. Cronan, you're going to lose your population of crafts, and what are you going to be doing next, huh? Huh. Nor used any form of poles or other thingies for them to defuse the weight. To be honest, before Isaac Newton had worked on the conundrum, Cronan had cause for concern over the number of grots in his camp. But Isaac had done the business all right. And now the process was far smoother. All right, many grots still turned into liquidized green sludge when he ordered a stop and most of them let go, leaving those directly under the bane blade to be instantly flattened. But Cronan figured these were within sustainability margins. Not that anyone would have put it that way, but such is the nuance of language. Oft it is whiffy and a bit conceited to some, but ridiculously parochial to others. Heh, <laughs> go figure. Nothing in life was perfect, thought Cronan, but it would certainly do. The second benefit, other than station of course, had been the fact that nobody could actually approach him if he was atop his thong, atop his bane blade. And that was worth every last grot expended. For as his power had grown, he had found that not even the rule of three had done him any good anymore. His people now reached from one horizon to another and beyond. And in that amount of walks, there was always someone who had not the cunning or insight to be aware of the danger they put themselves in when they so much as looked at the orc boss, let alone attempted to mob him. There was also the issue of him being perceived as being blessed by Mork, and so some had wished to just touch him. And that was tedious beyond belief. I mean, just imagine, <laughs> you're Cronan, you're walking to your thong, but then people are just come and say, Hey, Wobos! <laughs> Wobos! <laughs> oh, I'll also be irritated, guys. Like, yeah, you can touch me, but they're not excessively like that guys come on let me just get to my thong and let me concentrate on ruling over aqualonia oh gosh 
Oh, that's funny. That is actually quite funny and interesting. You know, that they'd want to also gain some of that, you know, think must, that, that, that kind of uh, cunning uh, energy from the war boss. And, you know, they just have to touch him. <laughs> they believe they'll get it if they touch him. Uh, that is so interesting. So the Bane Blade was of just the right imposing size and of the right height and width to keep pretty much all but a fanatical mob of mentalists from getting anywhere near him while in transit. Excellent. And of course, it looked spanking it did. Glittering in the morning light, it was a thing to behold. A worthy conveyance for the lord of nearly all of Aquilonia. But that was the rub, the crux, the nagging buzzing that constantly vexed the lord of Cullen. For he was not the true master of all he surveyed. Well, he was the vast majority of the time, like as he had utterly dominated both land masses on Aquilonia. And yet, there was still that clugnut, that dangler, that irritating pustule still remaining, the last Humi outpost on Aquilonia. Now over the time, Cronan had become increasingly disappointed in the vigor of the Humis, for nothing like this had ever happened before not in living memory, at the very least. And considering how atrocious orcs were about their history, even one or less generations later, anything more than a score of years before would be lost to the sands of time. And yet, Cronan had become most astute, and he knew things that others ignored. He knew that things had changed, because they had done so in such a short time as his meteoric rise to splendor. He remembered those times before, like how the Humis, but the Adipi are starters in specific, had always been too keen on a revenge-killing spree, as we have heard earlier in this chronicle. Therefore, rays into Orchidum to exact recompense for any victory, no matter how small, had been swift and brutal, exactly as they should be. And Cronan always laughed how the ultimate warriors of the Humis were in fact far closer to his kind than their own. Yet he was perplexing to the utmost, for none had come. None had even thought of revenge, retribution, retaliation. He had slain marines himself. He had slaughtered an entire Humi army on the open field. He had crushed and burnt and butchered the Humis wherever he found them. He had, in fact, done everything in his power, everything any orc could ask, to be honored with a suitable response. Yet, none came. I think it's because Aquilonia is not really an important strategic planet for the Imperium of Man. Uh, there's millions of worlds out there in the galaxy that the Imperium of Man control. And, you know, there's only so much resources that they have that, that they can use or that they have at their disposal to send to a particular planet to defeat whatever enemy is on it and then, you know, head over to the next one. So, yeah, th there's a lot of planets, a lot of uh, pulling interests and Aquilonia is just not that special, <laughs> Cronan. You know, for you, yes, because you've been born here, you've existed on this planet all your life so far. You know, you just believe that uh, this planet must be important. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not. So you have to garner the attention of the Imperium of Man in different ways, you know. And also expanding your war outside of Aquilonia, like go beyond the star system and go, uh, you know, conquer many other star systems that the Imperium of Man control. And then, and then they'll take notice of you. Yeah. And Cronan was, well, sort of desolate. It all felt like such a huge insult, really. And so it was that he had left the one major Humi settlement alone on purpose had crisscrossed the continent with his war, passing out on no less than three occasions. Now this was as close as he could get, without walking over the hills that shadowed and protected the conurbation, and stood there mooning. What in Gorka Mork's name were they playing at? 
Why had he left this place alone, some might ask. Well, it was a stair port, or something like that. Oh, a star port, okay, okay, stair port. <laughs> His Max had informed Cronan when they had first viewed the place. From these huge boring grey pads on the ground, the humans had ships, like massive trucks, they explained, that took them out into the stairs. For this was but one world, one place to be dominated. And the remaining McBoys, as Cronan had considered they might be taking the piss, so had snapped a lot until he was certain of their sincerity, had gone on to tell him that all of the lights of the night sky were, in fact, and reality, and certainly not a sad and annoying connivance, were other planets. Well, they explained lots of things about burning gases which made him chortle, lights in the skies around which the planet circled. It was all tedious to his bodyguards, and more than one preemptively assisted their master by silencing a few of the mechs with crumpings until Cronin noticed and waved them away. Wiping mech boy off their gauntlets, the knobs acquiesced, of course, but they were mightily surprised that Cronin listened to any of this cobblers. Sitting in his highest, biggest, widest, most thought-attracting hat, Cronin was now gobsmacked. The limitless potential. Cronin had known about wider Orchidum for some time, he knew that the great prophet of Gork, Gazgul, Mag Uruk Shraka, had come from elsewhere. But he had never really thought about where he had come from. And it now shattered his soul, broke his calm, removed from him all sense of time and space, security or accomplishment. For he knew that this world was only the beginning now, surely. And it is but a stepping stone. Uh, Cronan. As much as you may love Aqualonia, it is but a stepping stone to far greater conquests out into the stars. Yeah. So, Cronan had previously left the stair port alone, as he had expected, nay, certainly anticipated, more humies to arrive and attempt to stop him. As they had always done in the past. Always. Perhaps they were just late, is what he told himself. But now, after the word came of the final surrender of the last hive in the northern continent to Grinner de Backstabber, who had been sent up there as it was bloody cold. I mean, really nasty cold. Like you wake up in the morning and find there are squigs and grots trying to snuggle into your poo pouch just to escape the bitterness of it all. And Grinner did indeed grin too much. Perhaps the cold would wipe the smirk off his face it was the meanest and most miserable of duties. Hence, Cronad had sent Grinner. He had let him live, had allowed him to be a big boss in the war still. But Cronan had not forgotten his base treachery. Hence, Pong duties and tasks were always meted out to him first. Alas, when they had spoken on the new thingy that the mech boys had dreamed up, allowing both to see each other as if standing in the same room, there was Grinner. <laughs> it's so they created a holographic communication device or something? Or a video conferencing call? Okay. It seemed that the cold had frozen that annoying grin in place. All that differed was a chattering of the teeth and the icicles on his schnoz. All of that aside, the plain fact was that they simply were not biting. The humans were not arriving as they should. Not as they had before. And it was high time that Cronan let go of youthful dreams. He was a leader of a war, a prophet of the great god Mork. He had to be a realist now. He could not wait around. And thus, he had to take this last bastille of resistance and... And he did not quite know what at the time. All he knew for certain was he had to complete the job. He had to take all... All of Aquilonia. Yes, that that is an important question. You know, uh, you know, I've also wondered like what happens uh, when an orc war, right? Uh, they they control an entire planet, and they don't have space capable vessels. Are they just trapped on that planet, 
and you know they just go about their lives just doing the same uh process of you know eating grass fighting against each other and you know the war boss on the planet is just is just sitting there he's stagnant he doesn't do anything is that something that happens or is there some sort of like a drive within them you know to say that you guys have to leave this planet you have to go into space yeah i'm just wondering about that. so the next day he would enact his first reconnaissance in force to get a better look at the Humi stair port and so it was that cronan strolled from his tent the next morn ready for the activities of the day though he was in the very center of the city just north of the stairport, he ordered his tribal tent to be put up in the grandest hall. He didn't like the Humi beds and their intrusive sheets. He found it uncomfortable and, well, to be frank, but no less earnest, a bit unorky, really. His guard jumped from their slump talk reclined positions as he arrived, and it was like listening to a particularly enthusiastic piston factory as their mega armor whirred into place. Cronan had the doors opened immediately, as he stood, feet wide apart, shoulders back, hands on hips, in a powerful stance that proclaimed to all, from highest to lowest, from old norders to fresh youth, come and get some, if you think you're hard enough. The palatial portals were drawn back, and Cronan glared at the entryway, the thin and long corridor that led to his quarters that he could see down. It seemed to go on forever. And, as per the previous owner's rules, which Cronan liked intensely, none could start to walk down this long corridor until the doors were opened on his end. Protocol. Now, Cronan had never liked it before, never understand the poxy way the Humies thought that they could not only lord it over other races, but even their own people. But Cronan had spent his time in the trenches, pressing the flash meeting and greeting without eating. He had made his presence known in the war. They were his now. Yeah, uh, Cronan is the father of this war. You know, he knows everybody. Everybody knows him. Uh, they fear him and respect him. And he, you know, his position is solidified. It is secured. So, yeah, he is like the only war boss who will ever have such control over the orcs of Aquilonia. Like, should anything happen to him, anyone that replaces him, they, they just wouldn't be the same as uh, Krona. You know, the way he talks to his orcs. Yeah. Yet, now he understood. It was not for the person living there. It was for the others. If Cronan looked great, then they who followed him would feel pride or so. Not just in him, but in themselves. That they merely followed an orc so successful, so cunning, and yet so quintessentially orky. Hence he ordered the removal of the busts that had previously been on the plinths in the sconces every three paces down that long corridor, and had them replaced with his own image. To magnify his greatness, and, if someone was annoying, or even likely to annoy, he would bid them to perform the rite of kissing. Sidebar. Kissing? Kissing what? The bust? Okay. <laughs> the corridor of butts. Now the day that the cunning one had taken this particular stronghold, he had seen it immediately. He had understood. And the ideas that attacked his now receptive noggin went into overdrive. When he summoned Mad Duck Conkelstein, Hypocrates, who of course brought Happy Len, and Big Mech Isap Newtone, they were agog at his suggestions. Well, more a sharing of a dream, really. Their eyes had glazed as he had bespoken his mind, had passed on his vision. Now, some might say that the proposal elicited the kind of vacant stare one gives a person with authority when they have just verbally shat themselves in everyone's presence, and in such a way, with such an intensity, so as referrals to specialist services are made the instant anyone can feasibly escape their presence. But of course, 
This would not be the case in this instance. They were all just mind-blasted by the sheer avant-garde brilliance of their war boss. He was... He was a Renaissance orc. The proof was this. Hence had come before, of course. His invention of origrotomy, orkigami, the cunning mobile, his cogitations. He was omni-talented, omni-inspired. He was indeed the chosen one. This was definitely it. Most certainly not the thing I said before. No, not that. This, the good one. Thus they prepared this dazzling feat of bio-organic and architectural perfection in the one day. Len was particularly helpful in this regard. Who would guess that Len the Grot would know so much about bottom bio-thingies? The corridor was completed and set up before the morning question. And there it was. Every third piece of plinth, and on that plinth, the image of their lord. A perfect cast, a likeness, um, like no other. What? Oh my gosh. That's a bomb. That's a backside. Why? <laughs> Why? But not a bust of his head and face, for all could see that daily. He wanted to be close to his people. To those who got this far, surely they should know their leader better. Hence they had to look at the many forms of his buttocks as they strolled. Of course, the specialist he had employed on this work of art had made it biologically exact and honour of honours, had filled each set with much captured methane from the cunning one himself. They would be filled with his essence of cunning. Some gagged on the gases, not prepared for the power of the cunning one, but all understood by the taut and relaxed orbs that they were going to meet an orc who could quite literally clench their heads off. Sidebar over. Today, Cronan only had Grinner perform the rite of kissing, and thus he was a bit later than the rest, as he stopped at every prince to show his loyalty. And Grinner's hair squig was also a lot more windswept than usual when he arrived amongst the rest of them. Dacher von Smashoven, Mad Nut Krunkelstein, Gitzgusher McMurder, Isaac Newton, Hypocrates, and even Runt Herd Sidesplitter was invited. They stood and were talking through the potentials of a shufty around the Huey defenses when a massive orb of pure, unadulterated dental fury came careening down the corridor of butts. Tiddles! The Greenskins present did not miss a beat and actually sighed in relief. As Cronan strode to the door, his arms thrown out, bellowing a deep belly laugh. For surely there had been deep concern of late, for Cronan's pet had not been seen in days. And if he had not returned, none might have survived the wrath of the cunning one. And so it was, the Tiddles came bounding towards his master. He leapt into his arms as Cronin was bowled backwards by the monstrous squig. Oh, that is so cute. It had knocked over every butt in the corridor, but Cronin was so elated to see his pet that none dare mention it. The two rolled around on the floor in a horrific display of sheer power. The squig was huge and seemed even more bitey than before which was really saying something. And the fray looked so fast, the snaps coming from it could easily take off a torso, and, well, plus all the limbs and feet and head and stuff of anyone it actually hit. Yet Cronan was laughing all the while as he dodged it and punched it on the snout a few times. The thing backed off and sat, smiling at its master, now that the pet was sure it was indeed Cronan. For it was true, Cronan was even larger than when Nutcrunch, sorry, Tiddles, had left. And Tiddles then opened his mouth to his master and let out his long tongue. He had brought a gift. And what a gift it was. Cronan looked on in awe as he reached out and picked up the present. Tiddles' tongue then retracted as he wagged bodily in front of Cronan, who did indeed pet him well, but his eyes never left the gift. 
and nor did anyone else's in the room. What's the gift? For it was a thing so rare, so valuable. Not for itself, but for what it meant. And all looked on at Tiddles in wonder, for Cronan now held a leg, a large, humy leg, and it was covered in power armor. Tiddles. You know what that means. The Astartes are here on Aquilonia. But where exactly? And why haven't they started attacking, uh, you know, the Cunning War? Hmm, hmm. Tad brought Cronan the leg of a space marine. All in the room now laughed maniacally, fully, without restraint. Joy. They had been bought a thing to elicit unfettered joy from all present. For this was proof. They would get to fight the Emperor's own angles of death. The Adipi Arse Starters. The Space Marines. Angles of death. Okay, okay. When all the others had gone, given their orders to prepare, Cronan went to his Humi Tech, his data slate, what he called his menu. For he could not wait until the morn. He wanted to rush there right now to see them, identify them, confirm it, and then to charge the Marines full on. But he could not. He had to take this seriously. For these were not orcs. These were not slime like Tober or Tooth Smasher. These were not even the standard explanatory deference farces, or something like that. No. These were the best. In the first instance, Cronan had told himself not to get his hopes up, as it could be the smaller marines with the pointy noses. Starter level stuff, really. Smaller marines with pointy noses. Uh, does he mean like the beak helmet? Because that's the only pointy thing I know that the Astartes have, really. Or maybe he means something else. Yeah. And he felt he deserved more. But the size of the leg itself was enough. He had thought it so small as not to be the proper marines. But then someone else had held it. And he realized it was actually quite massive. Well, for humans anyway. It was just that he and Nutcrunch, sorry, Tiddles, had become so robust and colossal in dimensions, it could be nothing but an Adipi arse starter. And so, he skipped the anal minute tantrum and went straight to their entries on his data slate. But which ones were they? Which? He had to know. Anal minute tantrum. Wow. <laughs> Uh, oh, gosh. Was it the crimesome Trists, who, according to reports, thought they were quite tasty against orcs? Nice one. He looked forward to testing their assertions. Oh, so very much. Was it the Ultramarinades, which always made Conan think of cooking? A disgusting habit the Humies performed, dousing their dinner hours before eating it. How on Aquilonia! Did they have time to plan this far ahead? With the ultra marinades. Their lies, this boring. The spaced fools, or something like that. They looked doggy, but they had some amazing choppers and had even been advised by Gazgul as being premium tier marines, worthy of the collecting indeed. The blank tipplers, who had an eternal custard, or something like that. He wondered if they'd ever had problems with the Desert Raiders. Despite the silliness, Cronan wanted a crack at these ones. They all seemed to have choppers, a good sign that hiding and Daka were not the main event with them at the very least. And of course, the Blood Bangles. They looked more Eldar than Orky, if truth be told. But perhaps it was just the pics in this report. He hoped anyways. He didn't like the idea of Eldar Marines. It didn't seem right somehow. They already had the pointy-nosed ones. They didn't need more, thought he. The Silly Man Bears seemed appropriately named. They were like... Silly Man Bears, okay. Larger again, and of course, they wore the colour of wah. Green. Oh, yes, they did. He would be proud to crush them. 
the iron cans. Heh. They would bring lots of metal boxes, but they did look like they were up for a scrap at the very least. The Haven Guard, who seemed to just sneak about in their own castles like cowardly commandos or something. Well, so it seemed anyway. The Dork Angers seemed right up there with the blank tipplers, choppy, heavy, perfect. But they too wore the colour of war, to be treated with respect. A good fight it would be, Cronan hoped. The list went on. The tight consoles. The Angers of Darnation. The Angers of Furry. The Angers Hermillion. The Arstail Bras. The Average Sons. The Harharathans. The Cholesterol Lions. The Dank Crackhomes. And the Sexecutioners. So, so many to read up on. Cronan eventually skipped to his favourite bit and then got on with the day. He had a lot to put in place and he trusted his bosses as far as he could punt a giant squig off in mega armour. Well, he trusted them to be loyal. He trusted them to do as he told them to do. But it was their ability to understand their instructions he now constantly queried. But, to his surprise, the day went as well as any day can. Well, when it doesn't involve a huge kicking being dished out at the very least. Even so, all now seemed in place, and he was ready. It is time to fight against the last stronghold of the Humis and bring forth the Astartes to fight against the war boss and the cunning war. Hopefully it all plans out correctly. Hopefully Cronan wins and hopefully Cronan can be finally crowned as the king of all of Aqualonia. Yes. <laughs> Tomorrow would be fun, but he knew deep down it would not be the best of days. Not yet. That would be the day of the big scrap. And so it was that the day arrived, and Cronan looked on as a reconnaissance in force took place, and he was ready. From his vantage point over the entire vista, he could see all, could hear all, could witness the ways of war that were used that day. He looked down on the fortifications around this stair port. He had seen them before, of course, but paid little heed back then, for the reasons explained already. But I shall repeat these, as I do tend to waffle on inanely, so I would not be surprised if you had not caught it in the midst of my verbal tryst with your ears. In basic, he had left the stair port alone, as he had expected the Humis to bring more troops. Better troops. More worthy of a scrap. There, done. Now to push on. I think they'll, they're going to use drop pods, so I don't think they'll use the star port. I think they'll just use drop pods, drop the Astartes. Oh! You know what, I don't know about uh, the Astra Militarum, whether they use drop pods to send their troops onto the battlefield. Um, I only know Astartes using drop pods, so hmm. yeah, that might actually be a very good thing that uh, Cronan is leaving behind the starport and allowing the Humis to use it. Yeah, hopefully I'm gonna get some uh, Astra Militarum forces can, you know, come to Aquilonia. I just like the name, Amagetsa. <laughs> oh gosh. Thus Cronan now sat cross-legged in the highest peak, his own guard about 100 meters below him, as they could not make it up as high, due to their mega armor making the hand and foothold somewhat less dependable than usual. Of course, Cronan was nubile and did not wear his armor. What would be the point of guards if he had to perpetually festoon himself with his best armor? No point at all. And anyway, even without his armor, they all knew he could take out anyone in mega armor. As he had... Yeah, but you're dealing with the Astartes now. You're gonna need your armor, um, Cronan. You're dealing with Astartes. You said it yourself that these guys are not like... Uh, Tooth Smasher, they're not like October, Red October. These guys are different. So you need to be coming there prepared. 
most definitely and finally proven in his duel with Tooth Smasher. And so it began. The valley mouth filled with a carpet of tiny green beings that screeched as they moved forward, covering the entire plain before the Humi city, and it was running at full pelt towards said defences. Grot, a veritable sea of them. The hard points of the curtain wall were elevated nicely, and their darker was absolutely prolific. Waves of it crashed into the onward rushing, diminutive greenskin horde blowing entire columns or ranks of them to pieces as they charged. Sidebar. Grot Motivation 101. Now one might think that the normally cowardly and rather ineffective Grots would, by simple dint of their numbers, have tried to rebel again in the face of certain death. For in all of the history of Aquilonia, only Cronan had taken a Humi city. The mass charge had always failed previously. Always. Something that the runt herds and youths had taunted the grots with over the day preceding. And yet, Cronan was a leader unlike any the orcs had ever known. For he truly understood them, the grots. He had spent so much time with the herds, had an intimate knowledge of the little wretches both inside and out. Well, mostly their innards, if we can be candid. For in his early days of origrotomy, Many, many a grot had split or exploded on him. Yet, he had persevered and pushed through these minor hurdles. But more than this, he had witnessed the discussions of the runt herds all those moons ago, and his cunning mind had absorbed so much, like Osmostegi, that he was able to recall almost all at the drop of a hat, which was quite prophetic, really as most orcs now took off and threw away their headgear whenever Cronan hove into view. None truly understood why, but Cronan did indeed detest others wearing headgear of any sort. Least of all, hats from the Humis. And you know, if you're wearing hats for the, from the Humis, uh, you are a target. You'll be killed. I don't know when, I don't know how, but as soon as you pass by the war boss, you're going to be dead. So that's one of the reasons why they're taking off their heads as soon as they see Cronan. But I digress. Hence Cronan was able to fathom what motivated the Grots more than any leader had ever done in all of the history of Orchidom on Aquilonia. And it was difficult to compromise for an orc of his caliber, for it hinged on a trait, an emotion, that he had so little experience with. Fear. It ran through the Grots like a... Like a, like a particularly nasty drink that always comes out of your bottom too quickly. The grots were just, Ew. just about cunning enough to know when they were onto a loser. Barely anything else, but this they could get, so to put it. So Cronan would have to motivate them. And so it was that Cronan had indeed invited Side Splitter, the head runt herd, to his previous meeting. And it was with a tear of gratitude, of sheer joy, that the herd took his message unto his brethren. Side Splitter had gathered all of the runt herds together to inform them all in one go behind closed doors, so it did not get out too early, because everyone hated it when a really lovely event was ruined by spoilers. And when they all heard of the planned event, there too were tears of joy unabashed outpourings of overwhelming gratitude to the cunning one. The Groths are going to be going through something terrible, I know, I know. Ah, these poor things. It had been such a long time. None believed it would occur again, to have it not only permissible, but a phenomenal display, a veritable battle of ability, lauded throughout the entire camp, the entire war. This was a thing. Of wonder. The morn had broken hours ago, but that is when the event had begun. For Cronan had decreed that all of the grots in the camp be rounded up and placed in an area to witness the contest. For Cronan the Cunning had declared that a full on competition of colossal scale was to occur a contest of origrotomy. And so it was. 
that the runt herds had a hundred tables arranged and walked the lines to make sure no unfair practices or gubbins were being employed, like choppers or glue stuffs, for the art of origrotomy in its purest form had to be the use of the grot naked and natural. Ah, oh, these poor things, oh gosh. Thus the biggest enthusiasts were gathered and encouraged to perform their trade. Even some amateurs were given a table to attempt to reach the heady heights of contest winner, to show the beauty of their art. And so it was that the grots looked on in utter bowel liquefying terror as they were subjected to this display. And as one, they understood the implicit message Cronan was giving them with this carnival of barbarism. It was simple enough for even they, and it was thus. Anything the Humies do to them was as nothing compared to what was in store if they crossed the cunning one. Obey or become that thing. <laughs> Obey or you'll end up like these grots here. And thus, they would charge the lines all right. Here endeth the lesson, no matter how yucky. Sidebar over. The dacker sighed into the grots, leaving chunks of them everywhere, slaying scores with one rattling discharge. And then it began. The sounds of the grots, the explosions, the screeching, the high point, so much like his old sanctum sanctorum, his axis mundi, Cronan. Cronan observed and began to... to think. Now Cronan found the projection of his prescience into the perspective of the humans vile, but it could be useful. Most importantly, because the Arse Starters weren't really humans, not really. Their big boss, this Emperor, must have mixed them with the sons of War, the great Greenskins. They thought and fought much more like the Orcs. Cronan knew this. Yeah, maybe. It's possible that the Emperor might have spliced, you know, DNA that he might have acquired from the Orcs and he put it into his Gene Seed program. So it's possible. I don't know. <laughs> it is quite possible, I guess. Yet, their hats. They were the key. Their cunning was so powerful in them that the boss marines, these cat pains, had shields of pure thinking. And he now knew that this was a wellspring of cunning. And yet again, Cronan knew all too well that this emperor was only a babe in arms, was a puny god. Mork was mightier in cunning. And the Grots did help. They helped him on his way. The curtain wall of prodigious height, the darker, the large areas of boring grey rockcrete that held some of the humid battle wagons of the stairs. And he thought, so, if there were marines here, surely they had to come from somewhere. So they would have a wagon in the deep void above the planet. To take the city, he would need to crack the walls. To crack the walls, he would need to destroy the batteries. To kill the batteries would be near impossible, as their range was too great, far greater than his own big guns. And to take the space battle wagon would require another space wagon. So he would need to take the stairport and nab one at the least to take him up there. But the battle wagon above would pour fire into them as they took the city. And <gasps> that is when he saw it. This, all of this, it was the riddle of the boxes all over again, just with more boxes. He thought back to that first of all of his cogitations, his very first moment event, practice, of the dread art of thinking. And he sneered as he stood, the grot still exploding as he raised his mighty arms to the sky and gave thanks unto Mork. For he need not think again, not on this world. For Cronin the Cunning, the war boss of the Cunning War, he would do exactly the same thing he did to beat the riddle of the boxes the first time. Just on a far larger scale. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Now Cronan did not, of course, 
just use the one method of spotting, for he wished to gain a more holistic picture of the entire battle sphere. Cronan would never have put it that way, of course, as he was not a fop, but the general point still stands. Thus it was that while the grots were being exterminated wholesale on the ground, there was the one craft plying the skies above the full assault. So this is Darker von Smarshoven. Uh, he's cool, he's cool. I like the jacket, <laughs> the hat, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. For Darker von Smarshoven was the only orc he could trust with this level of task. And so it was that the uncannily skilled and restrained orc had swept across the skies above the stairport and taken more than a few picks as he had been instructed. And when Daka returned, Cronan had a very tidy amount of clear picks to view the defences. As Cronan perused them, he knew with the certainty of a Tau gunline being struck by an assault formation that this battle would be an art of bloodbath. Well, if he played his cards right. He also knew the exact tribe and culture of the space marines in the midst of the defences, for they wore red and yellow in quarters. They had to be the growling Hiffons, and they were tough. The assault would indeed be a pageant of slaughter. And so it was that Cro uh, I'm not sure who they are, though. Um, I heard Baltimore call out their names, but I can't recognize them. Um, yeah. They look cool, though. The red and yellow. They really look cool. Hmm. Conan began his preparations in earnest. Or was that Frank? Who knows and dares to dream? But back to the tales of high adventure. Cronan had given his instructions to Isaac Newton and his other big bosses. But some were less enthusiastic about the diktats, if truth be told. For much work needed to be done for Cronan's actual plan to take shape and lead to his boot being planted into the rump of the marines. So, knowing that the marines inside would need a hearty distraction, or else they might sashay out to cause trouble, Cronan gave them something to worry about each and every day of his preparations, which weren't many to be fair. Of course, he knew that the marines would be fortifying their positions further with every passing second. But needs must when the squiggoth charges, as they say. Or at least they did these days, as Conan attempt to make this little ditty intensely popular. How, one might ask? Well, by instituting the rule of three if anyone did not state it in every conversation at least once. Not that he got his guards to inform people before they even processed down the corridor of butts. Well, he did. But dissemination of such concepts is not particularly effective with knobs involved. So it really did take some doing, meaning a lot of crumpings in the days running up to the assault. But then, Cronan did indeed need to raise his fightiness, and his conveyance, his thong atop the now trackless bane blade, had actually diminished his proximity to the annoying. Hence, his need to crump had been similarly been diminished. And so, the new rules and crumpings helped out a lot, actually, especially with his left arm, that was now almost as meaty as his own right arm. Moving on, the boys did not really understand why they were being asked to throw themselves at the walls every day, but being truly orky ox, they did not mind in the slightest. Yeah, I think it's like a distraction. And, you know, just like Voldemort said, they don't really care about that, you know, as long as they get to fight. So, yeah. In fact, on one day, it seemed that the assault might actually get past the walls, but this was gratifyingly rebuffed by the intervention of some of those wonderful Adipi R starters. Especially, too much slathering from Cronan, the intervention of a tiny amount of the Nob Marines, the Primanus. They had been hiding them from Cronan's war, it seemed. Now, some might bemoan the loss of life, but not Cronan. For he knew that the mobs that had survived, well, the few boys that had come through the fray, would be stiffened up quite nicely, and the frustration of not making it over the walls would make their rage and fury unto Gork's own when the day of the real attack began. And, in reality, he had boys to spare at the present. Cronan was staggered when he saw the lines of them still arriving every day. From tribes and climes, 
he had never even heard of. Or like we shouldn't forget that you know it, he controls all the orcs on Aquilonia, and I don't know how many orcs are there. You know, on both continents, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, it must be like a lot, like millions, maybe even running into billions. Yeah. All across Aquilonia, still they came. His mind swam at the possibilities, yet how to use them if the humans were all gone? He sighed. Truly, when this last Bastille was ravished, as it should be, then what on Aquilonia would he do with all these mobs? A trouble for another time. He had sworn that he would not need to think again until after he was king. You, you can have the Squig games again, <laughs> like how the Speedwire had Squig games, or you can focus your energy and attention on building vessels to take you into uh, space and let you conquer the stars. Yeah, that is a very, very important option right there. Hmm. So he stuck to his word. It would certainly keep. Cronan never once used his back lesion in these assaults. Not because he was saving them from the carnage, because that would have been astonishingly spiteful to orcs so loyal. But he needed every last one of them for his plan to work to its best. And Cronan did not want to take any risks this time. He needed to mark his pathway to glory, to make the Emperor of the Humis take stock, so he would then send progressively more potent and fighty warriors at Cronan. One cannot expect to make it all the way to the gold ones without working for it, after all. He would have to take the head of the ring Catpane, their boss, or it all might be for nothing. Well, that was putting it strongly. For a good fight is its own reward. But he, unlike so many in Orchidum, was aiming much higher. His goals far outstripped that of any orc he had ever known, except perhaps the Prophet of Gork. Gasgall. Hence was all finally in place, all perfectly aligned. The moment had come, and Cronan could scarce control his excitement. The riddle of the boxes was about to be concluded to his advantage yet again. True, there were more boxes to this conundrum, but in its essence it was the same. So, if Mork was right the first time, and he surely was. Then if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Cronan leered his finest, most toothy leer as he rose on that blessed morn. And so it was that the Azure Falcon, strike cruiser of the Emperor's own angles of death, had a rather eventful morning. Now it wasn't immediately apparent that they were lax, for nothing could be further from the truth. There had been raids and cull missions on a regular basis. Storm Ravens and Storm Talons had been on near perpetual sorties into the atmosphere, smashing the huge collections of greenskins that had not yet arrived at their constant muster, and squads had been used to hem them in and butcher them all. But the main body was left alone and seemed utterly oblivious to what was going on, because the Marines wanted them all in one place, under the targeting crosses of their incredibly well-worked-out defences planet-side. And that is when the ship would unleash hell and make sure there was nowhere for the Greenskins to go, for they were scum in the eyes of the Emperor. Few Marines were actually present on board, so nobody actually thought to bother them with banal oddities. Now this is an opportunity for Cronan and his uh, war to commandeer this ship. <laughs> Since the, all the Astartes are on the surface of the planet, well, majority of them, uh, yeah, this is the chance to commandeer this vessel, yeah. And so it was that the flashing lights would at first ignored. They did not seem to be direct weapons of any sort. They were so harmless that not even the proximity or targeting sensors gave off any warning before they bloomed in the darkness of the void. Yet, as they seemed to be getting closer, 
the deck officer advised to summon the bridge officers to active duty. They had been in some form of long and waffly discourse, sitting like a clutch of hens, is what some might say, but more acute and astute minds would understand that the meeting had been thorough. The Marines did not wish to merely win a battle, for that, they all knew, would just mean that the orcs would scatter back to their old grounds. They would return to their turf and be dashed difficult to winkle out, as had always been the case on this world on Aquilonia. A pity, as the Humis had thought, that the plant had been rather a lovely little idyll with an incredibly long and rich history. Also, when the Greenskins had been leaderless, they had been easily handled, culled to levels where they were a nuisance, but not a threat. Now, none could believe that in such a short few years, the entire orb had been taken by an orc clustering. When the bridge officers arrived, they took stock, and without a second wasted, they gave new directions, ordered the light bursts to be analyzed. Orspec scanners whirred, and the regions were brought into far clearer picture. And this is when the most experienced mariners looked on agog. For in the midst of where the lights had burst, there seemed to be small things floating there. Another burst of light from the port and starboard, and one above, all seemed miles away from the ship still, yet much closer. So the new regions were enhanced again, and the mild amusement was now replaced with stark staring terror. For in the blast areas of these lights, there were indeed floating things. They were orcs, and they were getting closer. The captain of the vessel barked at all around to heave to and power up and raise the void shields. All of the ensigns snapped to and did as instructed, but it was not enough. Ha. Just as the ship was about to fire its engines, the bursts of light were no longer discernible. For a second, some thought they might have stopped, but the older hands worked even faster. <laughs> they knew. And it was these who did not jump when the alarms went off. The rookies practically escaped their skin, all looked at the lights and winced at the klaxons. They were used to them, but not expecting them. Not here, not above this dirt globe, because they had been boarded on mass on Aquilonia. Like how many, how many orgs have boarded uh, the strike cruiser? You know? Uh. Cronan looked on impatiently as Isaac Newton was using a strange contraption that covered one eye with a huge, well, a huge type of horn or something, like a hollow spear. Odd. It had glass at one end and the other. Huh. Yet as he looked up, he would nudge his instruments a tiny bit here or there, getting his grot to nudge others. And finally, he turned and gave the signal. He waved at Cronan. Man, where is that? The endlessly herdy grots and mobs were permitted to run away from the pads, as Cronan marched forward with a full battle mob of his guard, his elite, his black lesion. Near half of them, in fact. And that was a lot these days. Onto the pads they stomped, and, when the entire thing was full, off they went. Cronan leered at his boys, plus his main entourage, for he had brought Mad Nut Crunkelstein and Gitzquisher McMurder with him. And so, Cronan laughed along with his boys as a teleporter pad fired up and activated. Now, being thrown through a teleporter pad is much akin to the use of a shock attack gun, for it punches a hole through the warp itself and sends things rushing through, just on a much larger scale. Thus Cronan was able to defeat the riddle indeed, exactly as he had done the first time. When he had told Isap of his plan, to ask if it was possible, the big mech had not even needed to sink for a second before he was nodding like a maniac, grinning from ear to ear, which, as you can imagine, was quite a meteor-wide grin. And so it was that Cronan and his entourage appeared on the Azure Falcon, right on the bridge. Lucky for them, less lucky for the bridge crew. Yeah, that was extremely lucky, like to be teleported straight in, uh, straight into the bridge of the ship. Wow, you can decapitate the head of this snake 
so fast and you still have more than enough time just to clean uh, the entire ship deck by deck. Yeah. Hmm. For Cronan nor any of his boys were in the mood to be patient or tactful. In fact, they were rather rushed about the entire affair. I mean, it's not often that an orc gets to really get the drop on a Humi force, let alone invade a striped cruiser. But after interminable days of inactivity, watching all the other boys trying their hand at the city, even if they failed, they had at least had a day of fun and frogs in the trenches, amidst the shot and explosions. Ah, happy days to any greenskin worth his salt. Orky was a thud of cannon-hitting lines, either being magnificent, of course. For who didn't love a good scrap? Only weeping Eldar and wailing Humies actually required to win. They just didn't seem to get it. It was all about the taking part, really. So the Black Lesion rampaged through the Humies as if they were an inexhaustible supply. It was after only one minute of mega-armoured stomping, chopping, slicing, hammer-smashing, and claw-crunching, and the Humies had all been used up. The Legion was still arriving all over the ship. Well, most of them were. There would always be a few sets left to float about and cool their heels if Izap missed the cruiser. But generally, he was accurate enough. Hence, within only ten minutes, there were about 5,000 mega-knobs on board. Now Cronan was as enthusiastic as anyone else to get right into the thick of it. But alas, he would have to coordinate. Huh, the trials of being a boss. He sent his lesion under McMurder to take the most important segments where the Marines still existed. Which wasn't many by then. A squad in the hangar bay were really putting up a sterling defence though. Cronan was proud of them of course. Another enclave of resistance in the engine room, but everywhere else was dwindling fast. The Legion were, of course, ordered to clear their lower decks. Many had flamers and a real need for heat about them, so they mooched off down into the dark regions where the Scrawner Humies were, the Charter Smurfs, or something like that. This strike cruiser now belongs to the Orcs. It's not yet officially done, but you know, you can clearly see there's no one on board the ship that can defend or repel or push back the orc forces like all the Astartes that are on the planet. So yeah, this Tricruiser is going to belong to Cronan. In any case, there would be no issue now. Cronan had brought with him some minor mechs under studies of Isap, and they were already using odd beeping chain lines and muggins pushing them into the metal stands of the Humies. The Orcs were somehow trying to take over the ship itself. At one point, they heard it begin to say things, chirping in the annoying Humie language about destructing something called a self, whatever that was. But Self-destruct. You, you have to find a way to switch that off immediately. Who is ever in the control room, try and switch it off. The next moment, I Zap himself had arrived emptied the contents of his stomach over another mech, then wiped his mouth, heard the repeated warning, and sprinted to the controls. Using the wires and other muggins the lesser mechs had attached, he launched two of them out of the way and began to push buttons as if he were playing whack-a-mole. And with a passion and energy, one might only find in someone attempting to stop their feet being eaten by a mad pack of squigs. And he rested when the computer stopped talking and then returned to his activity at a much slower rate. Now all of this happened so fast that it might appear that there was practically no resistance. And that would be a total error to say. For the growling Hiffons had put up a real fight in many a segment. The Blaygard Elite Squad, led by Marconi Milan, had raced to the apothecary almost instantly. There the three veterans had held the line and slaughtered over three score boys from the initial waves, and then engaged in a never-ending set of duels. As they held one doorway each, and the mega armored knobs could come only one at a time. Yet, even after most areas had been clogged with greenskin dead, McMurder had arrived and taken the tired marines to pieces, allowing others to get inside to cut down the other two veteran arse starters from behind. All told, 
the marines had slain a further thirty orc knobs. Brother Castanas, the librarian, was reported to have attempted to literally cut his way to the bridge. He had used warp powers of his order to blind or even burst orcs in front of him. His four sword carved through a veritable stack of orcs also. But when he met with Mad Nut Kunkelstein, he was just no match for the orky weird boy. For the war energy was flowing through him, and the librarian was also fatigued. So the contest was short and final. But Murder then proceeded to the hangar to finish off all last resistance. But all he saw was a single storm raven flying out of the hangar toward the atmosphere of Aquilonia. They had gone to warn their cat pain. But before they had done all of this, the marines had trapped and neutralized near every form of transport or weapon in the hangar. Many orcs exploded while prodding or playing with the muggins that they had left behind. And soon it was apparent that Cronan's second stage of the plan might not happen at all, or so most thought. All they saw was no flying thingies, and no way for Dugger von Smashhoven to come up and get them, nor any way to teleport down, for there was no teleporter here, and Isaac had come up to the Wagon of the Stars, so he could not assist from the ground and use drop pods, use the drop pods, or use, uh, what, what do they call them, Thunderhawks? Is that what they're called? You know, the, the transportation vehicles that Astartes uh, can use. I, I think they're called Thunderhawks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I can't remember, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that's what they need to use. Either drop pods or a... Um, a atmospheric, space-worthy vehicle, yeah. The teleporters he had. Most believed it would take Newtone at least a day to recreate a plan to get them down, probably much more. But they had not factored for that cunning one. Oh, no, they had not. For when Cronan had organized the forces that would remain on this stair wagon, he then went down to the hangar himself. For the mobs left behind, were to be very busy indeed, and Cronan wanted eyes up on the bridge, making sure all went to plan. His divinely inspired plan could not fail. Well, it was highly likely to actually, but Cronan was like a mariner of legend, his firm and meaty, huge and heavy hand on the till of the entire war. And so it was that Cronan got to the hangar with Madnut and knew exactly what to do for it wasn't actually important for many of his knobs to get down to Aquilonia. Realistically, he alone needed to be there, to challenge and slay the leader of the Arstarters, the Cat Pain, for reasons noted previously. Thus did Cronan espy the teardrop-shaped thingies in their hangars, and because of his data slate, he knew exactly what they were. They were poop pods. This ship could send them down to the surface, Wait, what? Poop? Oh, gosh. At an incredible speed. Without a second thought, Cronan had his closest knobs bring some out, and the mechs were kicked until they opened them. More wires, more mechs being burnt or shocked, so that their blackened bodies gave off an incredibly burnt mushroomy whiff across the entire ship. Yet they managed it, and a full half-dozen poop pods were prepared. It was twice Cronan's favorite number, so it seemed Mork himself was smiling on their escapades this day. Cronan was quite large, as we know, so only he, Gitzkusha McMurder, and Madnut could fit into the pod. The doors were then pushed into place again by Meganobs, and they were winched into place. Without further ado, Cronan was plummeting through the skies towards a stairport. Well, he hoped he was. The margin for error was quite extraordinary, is what any passing layman might think. But when one is divinely inspired, as not only Cronan, but all of his war were, extending even to the weird boys like Isap, it made near all things possible. For their god, Mork, was indeed on their side. And so, the six tear-shaped poop pods were, um, well pooped out of the cruiser towards the planet. They hurtled down and Madnut made a toe of Mork, 
green spectral energies swirling around in the cabin as they collided downward. And through the toenail, as he had done before, Cronan watched avidly at the activity occurring below. His plan was working. The stairship itself turned on its axis, and its waste batteries now opened up at the port. It shot down, as the knobs had manually loaded and fired the huge Dacker cannons on board. Fire to the left of them, fire to the right of them. The ship was unleashing only a small fraction of its full complement, as many a heavy Dacker cannon exploded or fired madly wide. But those that came down were realistically aimed by Isap. And so it was, that Conan could see the shots missing his poop barely, but taking out one of the group headed down. But the war was in full swing. Battle wagons and trucks littered the approach to the port, fire billowing from the walls, from whirlwinds and thunderfire cannons, as the marines slaughtered entire waves of good orcs as they charged. Yet they were getting closer. The fire from the captured ship came down, and in one moment halved the batteries on the crenellations and caused mass confusion amongst the normal humans trying to put up a fight. The red and yellow marines dove from explosions, still firing down at the oncoming green tide. They were so accurate, so powerful. Heads and limbs were being torn off orcs as they came in. Cronan wished to weep from the beauty of it all, is what some literature would have stated. This was not true, of course but his eyes were like saucers as he took in all that was occurring. He and McMurder both drooled as they witnessed the carnage below, but Cronan also had a special twinkle in his eye. A look of almost fatherly pride as he saw the combined power of a Squigoth charge come barreling into the walls, tearing them down just as he had done all of those moons ago. Life was a great cycle of death and birth, bogey flicking leading to choppers, and shooters leading to crumpings, and then ultimately to being Big Boss. Conan could see the circle of strife, and he knew his place in it, as a provocateur. And it felt wonderful. But what didn't feel wonderful was all the waiting. He could see the bouncy marines, some with long guns, some with short ones some with choppers. They bounced around the stairport, now trying to take down as many knobs and mobs as they could. Bouncy marines. Okay, okay. So it's just marines with the jetpacks. And, you know, <laughs> they've been called bouncy marines. Ah. The marines had expected the walls to fall, it seemed, for they had many, many fallback positions and barricades in concentric circles within the port. They would unleash their pinpoint accurate Dacker into his boys, then fall back. So few of them had actually been ganked by his war, the Cronan laughed. This would take ages. Hurrah! Huzzah! Other leaders might have thought this a bit out of place. Callous or even careless. Yet Not for orcs. Yet McMurder and Madnut also giggled or tittered along. So he felt proper orky again. For nothing filled the heart of an orc more than the sight of a good scrap. Well, apart from being in said scrap. And that was about to occur. The last thing that the three saw in the huge green spectral toenail was the real attack now coming in. For Dacher von Smashhoven came streaking out of the skies with his mighty winds of war. And they filled the airs like locusts. They swept down and were wreaking havoc on the Humi defenders no small number of marines were also caught out while retreating. And, of course, there would always be some of the winds of war who were just too excited firing that they forgot to pull up. And so it was that the poop pods had plenty of competition as targets in the sky, so they all hit down. Well, almost. Or so, this heralded the other half of the Black Lucian arriving at the starport, and their ranks were unstoppable. When the last Squigoth had been brought down, the Legion simply charged at the defenders across a huge front. Now to say that landing in a poop pod is usually rather ouchy is a bit of an understatement. And when they did indeed decelerate, Cronan was actually glad he had not brought Tiddles along. 
because he would have become pate. The only way that Mad Nut had escaped becoming a smear was his prodigious green energy bubble around him, and also the entire poop pod. Mad Nut had attempted to use his powers to defray as much of the impact as he could. But McMurder and Cronan both had a rude awakening as the thrusters fired. Now, only months ago, both probably would have been shattered like the dreams of an Eldar dancer when they had been told that Flouncy Twirling had fallen out of favour. The force of it was so much. But Cronan had grown, had become far more dense and robust than before. And as he had grown, so had his boys. Of course, the better armour that both wore also might have helped a bit, just a tiny bit. But now they were down. The weird boy let go of his control, and the pod dropped to the floor, two foot. Now, orky magic is quite powerful, but rather unstable. So the green hand holding the pod had crushed most of it, so the three inside were a lot closer and pallier than usual. When the hand let go, the ball then had all of its ramp explosives go off at once, filling the entire cabin with ricocheting shrapnel. Oh, gosh. But only two doors went down. Well, burst off is probably the better way of putting it, I guess. And the three then burst from it like a triad of wrath from a dried prune. Overhead, the winds of war were dogfighting with the few marine fighters. They fought well, but they had no hope of controlling the skies. All around them, Cronan could hear the din of battle, the sweet symphony of slaughter. He looked around and saw two more pods smashed into the ground nearby. But alas, nothing came out of them. A pity. But then, that just meant more rampant arse starters for him. Most definitely. Most definitely. And Cronan could hear the loudest concentrations of Darkar. So he, McMurder and Madnut all rushed into the fray. The marines had fought like titans. The cunning one had to walk over entire carpets of greenskins as he headed onward. He had no doubt that had he not taken out the stair wagon, not smashed the walls from on high, none of his mobs would have gotten this far. No more. Definitely. If he didn't take out that ship, they would have just shot them from orbit and uh, destroyed the momentum of the cunning war. So, you know, having this infiltration... Uh, this boarding action on that ship really did save uh, Cronan, you know, a lot of time. And now he's able to push forward with the rest of his forces. So yeah, it was a good idea. No matter how plentiful they were, Cronan turned a corner and near walked into a small group of explanatory deference farces. He and McMurder roared as they butchered 200 of them. His chopper raising and falling, raising and falling, cutting swathes of them in half in a single swing. <laughs> Silly humies. McMurder was stomping the heck out of them and slipping off limbs with his claws. Mad not harbored his strength, as he knew these were no threat to the bosses. When they could not catch up to the last fleeing humies, they pelted it down another alleyway, attempting to get to the very heart of the scrap. And within moments, there it was, and there he was. The central stairs up to the massive building, which was now burning from anywhere over the third floor. Dacker jets jutted from it, and bomb blasts had blackened it, so that only tiny slithers of the alabaster walls remained untarnished. At the foot of the stairs was a circle of death. Red and yellow-coloured marines all stood behind makeshift defences, and snapped shots out of the oncoming waves of Cronan's mobs. Yet standing dead centre, right at the top of the stairs, not hiding, not skulking, but feet far apart, shoulders back, the cat pain stood. Conan recognised this stance, of course. He used it so often himself. The come on if you think you're hard enough stance. Luckily, Cronan did indeed think himself hard enough as he bellowed and launched himself into the air. McMurder matched, then outpaced the knobs rushing in, so he slammed into the marines, 
right at the tip of a spear of huge power-armored warriors. The Black Legion. Cronan landed but twenty paces from the boss of the Humies, and it was most definitely on. But this was not like his battle with Toofy. Oh, no. Utterly different. For the Marine Catpane did not mince about or engage in posing. Oh, no. He came at Cronan instantly, and near took his head off with a first sally. I'm actually quite happy that it's not the same, because really, to be posing before battle, no. No, 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 no. Um, it would have been really funny, though. <laughs> It would have really been funny. Oh gosh. But I think uh, Cronan is going to make it. He's going to make it. He has succeeded in destroying or neutralizing the ship in space. Making sure that any types of reinforcement is cut off. And they've surrounded the last uh, you know, stronghold of the Humies. They're outnumbered. They're outgunned. It can happen. It can happen. Just win this battle, Cronan. The Marine powered forward faster than Cronan had expected, lunging with his sword to impale the cunning one. Cronan stepped sideways and brought his own chopper down, like lightning, but with a power totally unexpected for such a shorty. Even if he were a marine, the cat pain blocked the blow and let it slide down his power sword into the floor, then uppercut Cronan with a power fist. Cronan felt his jaw shatter and lights burst behind his eyes. He felt himself flying up and then plummeting down. As he blinked, all he could see was dancing, wagging squigs for a moment. Then he shook his head and cleared them. He rose, much to the surprise of the cat pain, by the look on his eyebrows, raising to meet the back of his neck. Cronan sniffed, hawked and spat. A cascade of teeth larger than most boys' life savings came out of his garb. But he then growled, and attacked. The cat pain was quick, skillful, strong and experienced, but he was no proper orc. After a hundred blows were exchanged in mere seconds, Cronan saw his chance. He dropped his choppers and grabbed the forearms of the cat pain. Cronan's hands were so meaty that they encased even the power gauntlet. The cat pain pushed crackling power down his arm and Cronan could feel the flesh on his borrowed runtier arm sizzle. The pain was just about right, thought he, as he reveled in this last moment. For he did not let go. And with the other hand, he began to move the cat pain's arm backwards. The also crackling sword, the blade, slowly moving millimeter by millimeter toward the marine's face. The cat pain was stoic and resolute. His eyes met Cronan's as he tried again and again to reposition to slide his arm or wrists, or to release more power from his gauntlet. Yet the cunning one just smirked, as he reacted and never let go, never tripped, never stopped leering, as he then forced the sword into the cat pain's head. The Yumi was tough, real tough. He did not wince, he did not scream, he did not crumble or beg. He simply glared back at Cronan, as his head was cut into and his flesh burnt away. Only when both of his arms lost all of their resistance did Cronan know he had finally gone, had finally died. Cronan, 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 Cronan. Cronan then turned and hefted the cat pain above his head and screamed his most orky scream. The marines that were left were in no position to turn to look, but they knew their lord, the cat pain, was dead. And thus, so too were they. And within only a minute more, McMurder and the hundreds of Meganobs had made this a reality. No bouncy marines were left. No flying marines. Nothing. Cronan had done it. He had done it. Cronan was now king of all of Aquilonia. Yeah.
Cronan sat atop his golden chair, his thong, amidst the largest audience hall in the stairport, and atop his head was the jeweled crown of Aquilonia. Yet something, something was wrong. Something tasted like ashes. That nagging, buzzing idea raised its ugly rump and exhaled into his face. It had all been too, too easy. Where were the rest of them? The Marines never ran. Where was vengeance? Where was justice? And then he slowly rose, his eyes widening, his jaw dropping. But he had to be certain. He had to be. Cronan bound down the corridor at such a pelt that Tiddles Bear woke before he was at his destination. Cronan accosted the remaining exhausted mechs, raised hell until his needs were met. He had the other know-whats from the port and the space wagon sent to his data slate. And then he studied it for days. His doors remained closed, Tiddles deterring anyone entering. And he looked. And he looked again. Until he confirmed it. He knew. He was certain now. He had been cheated. He staggered, his arms barely taking his weight as he fell forwards, sending the contents of the table across the floor. His heart echoed in his ears like a million drums, drums that got closer and louder as he panted. He could not see everything. It swam before him, its shades changing. It darkened. As he felt his veins pulse, like they were filled with squig sharks. He could barely contain it. The hints had all been there, right in front of him. He had been a fool. He had crushed and slain the Emperor's angles of death. He had crushed the Emperor's weedy people in battle. He had raised every city of every one of their tribes and clans. He had gathered the Greenskin tribes and openly made war. But you must remember, Cronan, this is all on Aqualonia. One planet. <laughs> there are millions. Millions. So, yeah, you, you're you not really cheated. It's just that people are not really taking notice because you are just on one planet. Yet, they had not come. And now he knew why. Because they were elsewhere. The other R starters, the blisters of battle, the breath crop of Craig, the catifans, the marinaders, the blank tipplers, the bangles. Perhaps all of them. Perhaps even the gold ones. His dreams. He had been cheated. And Cronan knew. They. They were. They were at a bigger fight! The rage, the wrath denied, the drums in his ears. They heard him now. Everything was green. His body shuddered. He felt every sep burn. His skin contracted. The desk beneath him shattered. Everything was green. The color of rage. The color of... And he threw back his head opened his mouth, opened his mind, opened his very soul, and out it came. A scream that was amplified by every voice that heard it, and then emulated and augmented it, a ripple across reality. As it traveled across Aquilonia, and then out into the depths of the void. To be continued. Well, of course it is.
Oh, okay. I wasn't ready for that scream. I was not ready for that scream. Oh, that actually kind of <laughs> scared me a bit, honestly. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> guys, this was uh, Legend of Cronan the King uh, of the uh, Cronan the Canon playlist uh, done by Voldemort's Guide to Warhammer. And yeah, you know, Cronan might feel like he's cheated, but he must understand. I thought like he knew this. I thought he understood that, you know, uh, Aqualonia is just one planet. And there's millions of other planets across the galaxy that the Imperium of Man control, have responsibility over. And, you know, they are fighting multiple wars, multiple battlefronts across the galaxy. What he's doing in Aqualonia is... I would say it's insignificant compared to the, you know, the uh, uh, the rest of the galaxy and what, you know, the Imperium of Man is facing out there, you know. So, yeah, what what Cronan has done on Aqualonia is a success. It is an amazing success for him, you know, for him, but not necessarily for, you know, orc kind or orchidum kind, if I can say it like that. Uh, there are many other orcs, many other war bosses across the galaxy that have have already achieved what Cronan has achieved on Aqualonia and have succeeded far uh, greater, you know, in terms of controlling over hundreds of star systems and even controlling entire sectors. So, yeah, what Cronan has done is still a starter pack <laughs> if i can say it like that you know he still has to go through many other hoops uh for him to be recognized by the imperium of man as a clear threat and then you know he would have all these other organizations come after him uh in his menu you know and then if he continues to succeed in his battles maybe one day he will face against uh, the golden ones, the cuts, the cuts orders, you know, maybe one day he will face up against them. So he still has a lo lot of work to do as the king of Aqualonia. He still has a lot of work to do with his war. And yeah, don't be too angry, <laughs> Cronan. Focus your, your frustrations and your anger into making uh, ships, you know, for, for space worthy travel across the galaxy and yeah i'm telling you you're gonna win you're gonna win and you're gonna be facing up against your uh greatest desires and dreams and that is the golden warriors the cuts owed us <laughs> uh, but this battle was interesting um you know how he used his forces and how he's also uh used the forces that were going to board the the strike cruiser up in space and uh, how they successively controlled that ship and made sure that there was no reinforcements, there was no backup in terms of firepower from that spaceship uh, to, you know, assist the forces on the ground. And yeah, Cronan has once again won against the Humis. Uh, they underestimated him. They thought that, you know, it is just another dumb orc who has just become the war boss of his own uh, war. But really, he showed them flames. <laughs> he showed them flames, all of them, all of them defeated, routed out. And yeah, the last bastion of the Humis has now fallen under the control of Cronan. But like I said before, Cronan, you have a lot of work to do now. You have a lot of work to do. If you want to go into those fights that uh, the humans are having with all these other uh, species of alien, then you have to start building ships. You have to start conquering other planets. And you have to make a name for yourself, you know. And I'm telling you, they'll take notice of you. <laughs> they'll take notice of you. Um, yeah, guys, that's it uh, for tonight with... Uh, Cronan the Canon playlist. Uh, if you want to check out the original video of Legend of Cronan the King, as well as Voldemort's Guide to Warhammer, remember the links are in the description below. Uh, yeah, Voldemort's Guide to Warhammer YouTube channel. Yes, 
the links are in the description below. If you like my reaction, please give me a like, comment and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos. And I will see you guys next time. Okay? Bye-bye.